Well, hello, Maisha. Uh, great to Hi, talk Jerry. to you today. Uh, I think uh, if we could, we'll just start with just a little bit of yourself, who you are, um, organizational affiliations, and, and just those basics to kick us off. Thank you so much, Jake. It's great to be here with you. My name is Maisha Wynn. I am the Chancellor's Leadership Professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Davis. Um, I am also the co-founder and co-director with Tori Wynn of the Transformative Justice in Education Center, which we affectionately refer to as the TJE Center. We are uh, scholars, researchers, futurists, designers, thinkers, freedom dreamers, and we fund and support a lot of graduate students uh, who have similar kinds of commitments. Wonderful. And we've uh, been very lucky and honored to be collaborating with you all, we at ITF, uh, for the last couple of years. And recently, I uh, wanted to, to get your, your views and a little bit of background on this uh, toolkit we created, a scenario toolkit that you've been working with Black families around. And uh, just maybe start with um, where that came from, a little bit of you know where it fits in to the initiative that you're working on, and, and what were your goals you know, when developing this toolkit? Sure. So in order to talk about the toolkit, I have to go back to December 2019, mm -hmm. which was my first foray, if you will, into foresight thinking. I took the foresight workshop in person at Institute for the Futures in Palo Alto. And the entire time I kept thinking about, wow, these are powerful tools that would be incredible to get into the hands of educators. That was my initial thought. And I went with the question, what is the future of, um, what's the future of schools and educating Black children or something that had schools in it? Um, yeah. Over time and talking and building with colleagues, talking to them about my dreams of having Black children and their families be agentive in their own education experiences, many of my colleagues who were there who were not educators said things like, do you think schools can even do this? But I'm glad that they asked those kinds of questions. I'm glad that I was pushed because what I realized is my question wasn't just about what would happen in schools, but really my question was about the education of Black children, period. And given my own research commitments, I thought about the education of Black children, not just in the context of schools, because the trajectory of people of African descent has been that we didn't always have access to schools or we didn't always have access to schools that were giving us a quality education. And that still is the case. So um, when my partner, co-director, Tori Wynn, uh, did the foresight training in March 2020, I think it was the maybe the last one before we mm. closed for the pandemic. Yeah. Um, he was convinced he was he saw the vision and we decided that we were going to be a futures oriented research center we literally revisited our mission our vision we pivoted very quickly and um the question then became what is the future of black education when we were all brought to a standstill during COVID-19 uh, global pandemic in March 2020, when our schools closed here in California in March, um, we, I started to collect signals. I started to collect signals that I thought might help me think about the future of Black education. Mm -hmm. One among the many signals was this um, coming together of Black families around uh, homeschooling efforts and cooperatives, even families who had different work commitments would figure out how to partner with other families. And then as time moved on, I started seeing signals around, uh, after George, the murder of George Floyd, there were signals um, that talked about Black parents saying, you know, I'm not sending my kids back to school and it has nothing to do with COVID-19. It has to do with anti-Blackness and structural racism. and. It has been wonderful to have my child here at home where I can see them, um, him, her, them, uh, and support them and their needs and not get random phone calls from the school about what they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't want to go back to whatever that thing was we were doing beforehand. And so we thought, wow, this might be a really great time to think about building out a toolkit where Black families could, together with their children, imagine what it is that they want as a family, but you know, individually, but also collectively. 
toward what I refer to as self-determined futures or futures that have many pathways forward. And it seemed like a great moment to try to think about what this what these tools could look like. And that took us into the space of drafting the scenarios, which we've been doing with incredible support with the Institute for the Futures. We could not have done that without the guidance of Institute for the Futures. It's, it's, it's very um, um, rewarding for us to think about as well. Like, okay, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe this is the, the, the long dream moment for futures is yeah. getting this into education at a more, you know, baseline earlier level uh, into the curriculum. So uh, all, all of that coming together is, is really, is exciting to see, you know, just as you think about, you know, that, that, that moment in time and where it could go. Um, so you, you developed some scenarios. Um, I, I think there were at least five. Um, yeah. I'm just kind of curious, uh, you know, some of the contours of those. We don't have to go through all of them, but maybe, you know, some of the themes that that you all were working with as you thought through those different possibilities. Sure. So one of the scenarios that was uh, written by Tori Wynn was uh, parent as teacher. And that scenario imagines parents being paid by um, the city uh, uh, to stay home and educate their own children. Uh, that was very much informed by some of the signals around when it was time to come back to in-person learning, I think later, like in, like in 2021, um, Tori was imagining what would it be like if we just supported parents doing this since this the reason why a lot of parents, Black parents in particular, could not imagine homeschooling is because they can't lose that income, that source of income. And um, so we presented that scenario at our community event a couple of weeks ago. There was another scenario that our team drafted together around imagining an HBCU, historically Black college or university here out West um, mm -hmm. that was in the Silicon Valley. Uh, that had a uh, focus on fashion, social media, um, a lot of tech savviness that um, many young people are uh, connected to. And let's face it, a lot of adults are building businesses and brands from as well. So right. those are a couple. And then uh, one of our grad students, um, Andre um, Thompson Anderson, did a, a, wrote a scenario about land as school, where he explored the possibility mm -hmm. of an entirely outdoor education, um, also inspired by the fact that, you know, we weren't thinking about being back in enclosed spaces and, and also taking advantage of what nature has to offer, um, signals around what it means to be a citizen scientist mm -hmm. and think about um, our relationship to our planet, uh, climate change. Uh, so those are just three of the five scenarios. Yeah, it's, it, it's really interesting to hear, you know, the range from, you know, maybe not paradigm busting, um, but innovative, like an HBCU in California, which I didn't know until embarrassingly recently, there well, there wasn't one, yeah. which is surprising. And then you think for a second, not surprising too. Um, and then, you know, into something that really breaks the, the mold, like, okay, school, nature as school, or, you know, something that's sort of out, outside of our or normal expectations of what a classroom is or how instruction takes place. So I, I, I love to hear that range. So you did you did a pilot a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago or so, four weeks ago maybe, um, with a group of families. And just it, any anything come out of that experience that were highlights or notable uh, yes. pilot experience? Yeah. So I have some interesting. There were just some fascinating responses to the scenarios. One thing that was really uh, beautiful was that we had. Um, we, we jigsawed things a little bit. So first we had parents working with their children. Then we had parents working together and children working together. And then we came back together. So it was interesting hearing the children process and think about land as school. Some of the children were concerned about climate change and if we could even depend on having school out outside in the world, which I thought was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. One of the issues that came up with parents as teachers is one of the parent, grandparents actually said that she thought that the system would find other ways to police and target the families who were doing this kind of work. 
So as positive as she felt about that as an opportunity, she believed that there would be legislature or something that would come to bear that would target Mm -hmm. this, especially if it was actually being productive. Mm -hmm. They had real concerns. And uh, Lynn was there for this wonderful moment. But when we were trying to bring the parents back to the larger group, the parents refused to come back to the larger group because they were still talking. (laughs) (laughs) The children came on over, but the parents said, no, we're having a moment. And Mm -hmm. it also just let us know that families need more time with each other. Mm -hmm. They needed to talk and troubleshoot and share and exchange experiences. So the scenarios became a beautiful um, vehicle through which they were able to communicate with each other, their concerns, their um, excitement for the future, their um, anxieties, and they needed that time. So we could Mm -hmm. have easily built in more time for some of those smaller group group Mm -hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so I want to leave you with a very futury question as our close. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, 2033. You've been <laughs> working in this zone for 10 years. Uh, what are the stories people are talking about in terms of of the center, your project? Um, you know, the sort of in, in that ecosystem. What are what are some aspirational stories that you would love to see people? I would love in the year 2033 that we have this toolkit for Black families thinking about self determined futures. We have tailored scenarios for every region in this country. Uh, We have these satellite uh, workshops, maybe even pop-up workshops at different events, cultural centers, um, festivals that families want to participate in, uh, that we're leveraging models from uh, organizations of the past uh, during the Black Power and Black Arts Movement mobilization, organizing strategies to make sure that we're getting these tools in the hands of families wherever they may be, whether it's, you know, rural place in the South, um, in a suburb in the North or a city. Um, I also imagine opportunities for young people to develop their own scenarios, but not just have them develop the scenarios, but have it be part and parcel of a working group that would actually make some of their visions real. So I think introducing these tools is so powerful. I want in 2033 to not only just introduce the scenarios, but have some sort of mechanisms whereby some of the ideas actually get to be implemented and that we're not just dreaming of these worlds, but that we have something in place to make some of these visions come through, if not the entire vision. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, Well, uh, it's, it's really thrilling to be a small, small part on this, uh, this bandwagon vehicle that you're creating here. And uh, I hope the momentum keeps going and um, you know, that people are writing stories about black education being the vanguard and, future ready, you know, like that, all of those, those wonderful things that you're investing in right now pay off uh, on that time, time horizon and beyond. So um, thank you for your work. Thank you for taking some time today to talk about it. And uh, onward, we'll see what happens next. I'm Thanks. excited. Thanks, Jake, for believing in the project and being such a wonderful thought partner. It's just, it's been incredible. I mean, between the foresight training and then the design futures training, which pushed even more. I just think that, you know, we were well equipped to even start this work and we couldn't have done it without that strong foundation. So thank you.